in line with our strong commitment to our price stability mandate, the Governing Council took further key steps to make sure that inflation returns to our 2% target over the medium term. We decided to raise the three key ECB interest rates by 50 basis points. You just heard ECB President Christine Lagarde at our Monetary Policy Press Conference on the 21st of July, 2022. She announced our decision to raise interest rates by 0.5 percentage points. It's the first time our rates have gone up in 11 years. There's a lot behind our decision. Inflation is high, and it's putting a strain on people. This is still mainly due to the very high energy prices, but supply bottlenecks, high demand, and a lower exchange rate are pushing up prices too. The economy is also growing more slowly, and borrowing is getting more expensive for people and businesses. Many are worried that too high inflation is here to stay. That's why we've raised interest rates, to send the message that we will not allow inflation to stay above 2%. This decision is important for everyone in the euro area, which is why today we're going to explain what interest rates are and what higher rates mean for you, for the economy and for inflation. A couple of weeks ago, before we decided to raise rates, I spoke to Gabriel Gluckler, advisor here at the ECB, about all this and more. You're listening to the ECB podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Katie Ranger. Gabriel, great to see you again and to have you on the podcast to break down this really important topic for us. Great to be back, Katie. Now, before we get into the whole mechanics of it all, how interest rates work, the real complicated stuff, I really want to just go back to basics. What are interest rates? Well, interest rates are often just loosely talked about as the cost of money but more correctly would be the cost of credit. An interest rate tells you how high the cost of borrowing is and how high the rewards are for saving. Why do we need them at all? Why can't money just be free? <laughs> well, yeah, it's <laughs> a good point. Um, well, economists have a saying and it says there's no such thing as a free lunch. And I think the same is true also for money. Uh, money is not free and there's an interest to be paid because you could look at it like a compensation for risks about the future and the future is by definition uncertain. So just to take an example, if you, Katie, were kind enough to lend me, say, 100 euros so I can buy a flashy pair of new trainers and then I promise to give that money back to you, say, in three months' time. Now, if we do that, you run a risk because in three months' time or over those three months, I could be running off, leave town, never to be seen again. You could run, run away with said trainers, right? With said trainers, At exactly. At the speed of light. I might go broke and not actually have the money to give back to you. I might, God forbid, I might die and just not be here anymore. So there are a lot of reasons why you might not actually see your money back after those three months. And therefore, you want to be compensated for that risk because you take that risk. And that compensation is the interest I need to pay to you over and above the 100 euros, which I need to get back to you. Another way of looking at this is in terms of what economists call the opportunity cost. If you lend me today those 100 euros for three months, you don't have the money available for things that you would like to buy. I'm the one who's losing out. Not necessarily, but there's, in a sense, a sacrifice now yeah. for some reward later which is when I pay back the money and the interest. Mm, true, yes. But for me, it's the other way around. With your money, I can buy those fleshy trainers today that I wouldn't be able to afford otherwise. So I have that benefit of enjoying something today and only pay later, and that costs a fee, and that's the interest rate. Okay, so it's uh, depending on what side you look at it from, it's an opportunity or it's also a risk. So there's a lot of this this compensating for risks taken, and, and that's the interest rate there. Correct. And there's not just those risks. There's also other risks, in fact, that are all kind of incorporated in interest rates. One thing is we have inflation risk. So go back to the 100 euros that I borrow from you, and today they buy me this flashy pair of new trainers. Mm -hmm. But if by the time I give the money back to you, you can only buy a pair of flip-flops for that, 
because the purchasing power of that money, of those 100 euros, has gone down. That's quite a big change in purchasing power, but I get the point, yes. Exactly. <laughs> That's a risk. And again, you want to be compensated for the risk because after all, if you lend me that money, you want it back, you want the real value of that, mo of, of that money back. And also that risk, that purchasing power goes down, also feeds into the interest rate. Okay. And then there's another one which we call liquidity risk, which is all about the money being available for the use at the right moment in time. So having liquidity available. Correct. So if I promise to put my money in the bank and I basically then lend it to the bank for them to use for other things, hand out mortgages and so on, mm -hmm. but I say, okay, you can have it and it will sit there for two years, say. So you won't touch it for two years? I won't touch it for two years. Then the interest I get from the bank is higher compared to if I always wanted to have it available at any moment in time. That's because I would run a risk that I might unexpectedly need the money. Mm -hmm. So I park that money for two years. And if in between, I suddenly need that money at short notice, then I won't have access to it. So in a sense, I, I have a risk of not being liquid. And I want to be compensated for that. And that's the higher interest rate. Okay, so we've covered what interest rates are and why we need them to, to cover this, this risk, these various different types of risk. Let's get to the complicated part, how they work. Now, interest rates have been low and, and haven't gone up for a long time, especially here in the euro area. And some of our younger listeners might not even remember when they last went up. Now, Gabriel... What happens when rates do go up? Can you explain that to us? Absolutely, I will. But maybe it's good to go a little bit back in history because it wasn't always like this that rates would go up and down. If we go back in time long enough, say around 5,000 years, that is when the first time the, the whole concept of interest showed up. So we have records from ancient Babylon back in 3,000 before Christ about interest being charged for borrowing grain. So it wasn't just on money, it was also on grain, on livestock. And the interest that was being charged was a whopping 33 and a third percent. 33 and a third? For grain, and for silver it was 25 percent. My goodness. What I find most fascinating is that that rate remained pretty much unchanged for two and a half thousand years, until about 500 BC. So, Katie, you talked about rates not moving for a while. I think that was a very long while there. Well, yeah, 11 years compared to 2,500, quite a big difference. We also then had a long period of time when the very idea of charging interest was considered sinful and therefore, in fact, outlawed. Christianity, for many centuries, made no distinction between interest and usury. And usury, that is and kind of an indecently high charge on credit that would be basically unbearable for people who borrowed and ultimately condemn them and sometimes even following generations, their children, to serve them. And until the modern era, the church therefore declared it immoral to charge interest to your brother or your sister. And to the present day, much of the Muslim world disapproves of the notion of interest. And we have a field called Islamic finance, which works to make modern finance conform with the teachings of the Quran. Fascinating. Now, to the modern times. These days in our modern market economies, changing interest rates play a powerful steering role. If interest rates go up, it means that borrowers have to pay more for a loan, and savers enjoy a higher return on their deposits. It's a powerful market signal that determines the zillions of spending, saving, borrowing, and investment decisions that all of us take every day. And that's the key, isn't it? It's, it's all about these decisions that are taken on a daily basis. But, but what I really want to know is what is our role, the ECB's role in all of this. Now, when I was preparing for the podcast, I did a little experiment and I googled interest rates to see what came up. Now, of course, the ECB's rates were in there, but it was buried amongst 
millions of results on different types of interest rates, all with different names, mortgages, loans, even student loans. I saw that as well. So obviously, the ECB's interest rates are, are just one of many. But where exactly do we fit into all of this? Well, maybe the first thing to say is that we as ECB, we don't actually set the interest rate that you pay for your loan, or for your mortgage, or that you receive on your savings. But what we do is we influence them. So what you found in your Google search is what we call market rates. And we as a central bank, as ECB, we can influence those market rates via what we call the key or policy interest rates. So how does that work? Our policy rates are those rates that we set for banks that want to borrow money from us, the central bank, and for the money they keep with us overnight. Then the interest rates offered by those banks to people and businesses outside move more or less in tandem with our key rates. Okay, so basically banks can borrow money from us or put it with us overnight, and the rates that they are charged or the rate that they get for that is then passed on through their operations. Okay. Correct. So higher key interest rates. So we put up rates, higher rates, for example, mean that money is more expensive, so to speak, for banks, and they pass the cost of money, so to speak, onto the borrowers, and they raise interest rates for people like you and me who come and want to have a mortgage, for example. Now, this is an impact. We spoke about how it affects decisions on how much people, businesses, consumers can afford to borrow. And by extension, this influences how much money you've got left to spend on and invest on the things they would like to do. So if you want to think of an image, it's, it's a bit like a gas pedal or a brake in the car, just applied to the economy. When accelerating, the central bank lowers rates, making the cost of borrowing cheaper. And when putting the foot on the brake, the central bank raises rates, and this increases then the cost of credit. So the overall speed of economic growth, to stay with the same image, in turn then affects how fast prices in the economy are rising and therefore inflation. Okay, you use a car, which is not very uh, ecologically friendly. So here's my question. Do our rates determine how much my bank will charge me for a loan to buy an e-bike, for example, then? That's a lovely example. And it's much, much better than my car. Absolutely. <laughs> um, they do influence the cost of your loan. But there's also lots of other factors at play, like the demand and supply of money in a free market economy. In other words, how much businesses and people want to spend and invest, how much money there is available, and also how much competition there is for your custom to offer you, Katie, a loan. Okay, so ECB interest rates influence the rates that we get on loans um, from, from our banks, but there are also other factors at play. Okay, got it. I'm with you. Now, obviously, the ECB influences the rates for all countries in the Eurozone. I mean, the euro is the official currency in 19 countries, soon to be 20 with Croatia. But does that mean that the rates on loans and savings are the same across the Eurozone? So if I go and ask for the same loan in two different countries, will I get the same conditions? Well, I think you're pointing to a very important aspect that is very special to the Eurozone there, Katie. As you're saying, the Eurozone is made up of 19, soon 20 countries. And each country is, of course, different. So we here in Frankfurt at the Central Bank have to make sure that what we decide here actually reaches people and businesses out there in a reasonably even manner across all the countries of the Eurozone. Now, that process we call the transmission of monetary policy, quite technical. Now, how that works, there's various channels that at work. They involve banks and financial markets and people's expectations and so on. That's how this transmission works, basically, from here all the way into the economy. And it's absolutely essential that those channels work smoothly and without distortions. So that our decision here ultimately reaches people and businesses on the ground across the Eurozone. Going back to images, which is very important, think of it like dropping a stone in a lake. If you do that, usually it produces 
pretty uniform ripples across mm. the surface of the water. But there could be places, for example, where the lake is frozen or whether there's driftwood or where there's debris in the water. And then suddenly, these ripples don't propagate as smoothly because the water has a different properties or different conditions in different places. That's a really, that's a really good image, actually, to, to imagine what it looks like. Now, and that's something that we absolutely have to pay attention to. So we don't just have to decide on the, what's the right level of interest rates for the Eurozone as a whole. So what's the right policy right now? But we also have to make sure that all corners of the Eurozone effectively feel, so to speak, what we're deciding. So let's recap. We've learned what interest rates are, and now we've also learned how they work. And we've even learned about this idea of their effects being transmitted evenly. Let's turn to the practical side. Now, ECB interest rates are expected to go up. It's high time, some people say, because rates have been very low for very long. Why exactly has that been the case? Can you just explain how we got to where we are? Yes, I think it's very important to also frame what's happening. So for a long period of time, interest rates in the euro area have been very low, or even negative, so below zero, particularly after the financial crisis and the European debt crisis. So during the past decade or so, inflation was very low for a whole range of reasons. But it, it was, in fact, too low for too long. And lower interest rates have helped credit to get cheaper, and this in turn then boosts investment and consumption. Many jobs were created, and with, with many more people in jobs, meaning they got income, and they go out and spend, and the economy recovers. And as the economy recovers, also prices were slowly increasing again. Because there's more demand in the economy for, for things going around. Absolutely. But then came COVID and the lockdowns and with, with it, this massive shock to our economies. Again, our low interest rates and making sure that there's enough credit available at favorable rates made sure that the economic hardship that was inevitable with such a, a huge shock was not more severe and didn't last longer than absolutely necessary. You mentioned inflation there, Gabriel, and we are in a very different situation at the moment on that front. Inflation is too high, and that's the context in which we're working at the moment. Let's look at the practical side of things. What exactly does a rate hike mean for people, for you and me sitting here in our daily lives? How will we see that? Let's make it very concrete, a written example. Say you want to buy a house and you need to borrow 100,000 euros at an annual rate that, say, now is 3%, but it used to be 1%. This means you will now have to pay your bank 3,000 euros in interest per year and not just 1,000, in addition, of course, to paying back the loan. Mm -hmm. That may mean that you, or maybe other people who are in a similar situation, may rethink their decision to buy a house. And the same also is true for firms who are wanting credit to expand their business. So if, if that cost for borrowing goes up, they may reconsider. But it also works the other way around. If you say you have more money available that you need right now, and you decide to save it and you stick it in the bank. The interest is the money that the bank pays you, so to speak, because they borrow, in a sense, money from you. Yeah, like what we talked about at the beginning. Exactly. And, for example, if you put a 1,000 euros in the bank account for your, for your savings and the annual uh, rate of interest is 2%, then at the end of the year, you will receive 20 euros in interest. So instead of spending, you see that extra interest coming in and you say, maybe it's better to save and not to spend. So if we zoom out from you and me and the effect it has on us and look at the broader economy, it means fewer purchases by people, fewer investments, more people will be saving because there's, they can get more by leaving their money in the bank. That would mean that the economy would cool down, right? Correct. That's the mechanism. And as a result, and that is for us as a central bank the most important thing, also, the pressure for prices to rise will diminish, and hence inflation will come down. 
So for us, taking that macro perspective, Katie, that you mentioned on the economy, as a whole, the mechanism goes like this in normal times. If inflation is too high, because there's too much demand and not enough supply, we can raise rates to make money more expensive. This way, we slow down demand and investment, and this will gently cool the economy and eventually inflation down. You say in normal times, Gabriel, but I do want to be frank here. We're not really in normal times at the moment. I mean, we've just gone through a pandemic. Hopefully, we're coming out on the other side, but who knows whether there will be a new wave and how that would affect the economy. We're experiencing war on our borders in Europe for the first time in in over 75 years. So it's difficult to speak of normal times. You're absolutely right. These are not normal times. And currently we're facing a very unusual situation in which inflation is high, but economic growth is actually slowing, at least for the short term. So Russia's war in Ukraine has pushed up energy prices and food prices and worsened what we call supply bottlenecks, just at the moment when they were starting to ease after the pandemic. So what does it mean? It means that many companies still find it difficult to get the materials, the spare part, and enough qualified workers that they would need for their production. And if they do get it, they often find that these inputs have become more expensive. Now, what will firms do then? They will eventually pass on those additional costs to their clients and their consumers through higher prices for their products and services. So what we're seeing right now is that prices are going up for more and more groups of products and services across more and more sectors of the economy. Okay, so what can higher rates do then in this situation, given that it's not, we're not in normal times? So what higher rates will do is two things. First, they work via something we call inflation expectations. If people and businesses start to think that high inflation is here to stay. They want to be compensated. So workers will demand higher wages, and employers may in turn put up prices. Now, that then turns into some sort of self-fulfilling spiral, which we call the wage price spiral. Workers ask for higher wages. Companies have to put up prices to be able to pay those higher wages, and it just keeps going round. Correct. But we can put if you want a stop sign up there and say, we signal we will tackle higher inflation. And not just saying it, we follow through with our action, and that is actually raising rates. And we show this way that we will not let expectations of higher inflation become entrenched. We will make sure that businesses and workers and investors can be confident that inflation will come down to our 2% target over the medium term. So that's one channel via the the inflation expectation. Second, and as mentioned before, higher rates also have that cooling effect, and they take the pressure off, as I mentioned, because they can help to bring demand in our economy in line with supply. As people and businesses rethink their decisions to spend or invest, because rates are going up, that counteracts the price rises that we see spreading and ultimately reduces inflation. Okay, so higher rates will help to bring people's inflation expectations down and it will also help to cool down the economy by by reducing demand a bit. Okay. There is one last aspect that I want to ask you about and that's kind of, I would say, the word that has characterised at least the last few months and that's uncertainty. We don't know when the war will end, for example. I also said we don't know what will come for the pandemic, what's next. What can you do about that? Well, we as a central bank, we cannot take away the uncertainty about the future state of the world. This we cannot do. What we can do is take away any uncertainty about our commitment to do what is necessary. And ECB President Christine Lagarde has explained several times that we're now on what she calls a journey to normalize monetary policy. So to move away from some of the unconventional measures that we have used over the, uh, over the last few years. And in terms of interest rates, the topic of our, of our podcast today, 
we now talk about a sustained path of interest rate hikes. So this is this journey, the journey that uh, Christine Lagarde referred to, which of course starts with the first step, the one we're expecting, but there are more to come. And how fast those further steps will be taken and how big those steps will be depends on how the economy develops and how we see in our assessment how inflation is evolving. Thank you, Gabriel. This has really been a very insightful and important conversation. So I'm really grateful for you taking the time to to break down this topic for us. Now, before we wrap up, as you know, as a regular to the podcast, we always have a question that we ask our guests, and that's for a hot tip linked to the topic we're discussing today. Gabriel, what do you have for our listeners? Right. For our topic today, I would recommend a fascinating book by the late David Graeber, and it's called Debt in the First 5,000 Years. I found it very, very stimulating. He's an anthropologist, and in his book, he takes us on a fascinating tour covering millennia and many different civilizations and cultures to show how concepts like debt, credit, or money, which are pretty abstract, relate to people's social relationships, what happens between people, to the institutions they create for their societies and to the power that's exercised there. In fact, some of the nuggets about the the, the ancient history that I mentioned earlier are also treated in his book. I wanted to say, actually, anyone who liked your anecdotes at the beginning would uh, certainly be into this book, I reckon. Absolutely. The best bit, it's not dry. It's written very well in a very engaging style. And, of course, you may not agree with his premises or where he ultimately takes his argument, but I could not help but admire his efforts to fundamentally challenge, and if you want, unhinge, a whole conceptual edifice of how money, finance, and markets work. Katie, I've been working at the ECB and in central banking for over 20 years. You want really at the heart of today's money system. And I found it refreshing to think in new ways about this system and follow him and how he questions many of, to speak, the truth that we hold to be self-evident in this field. So a very fascinating and stimulating read. Okay, David Grober, Debt the First 5,000 Years, another brilliant hot tip. Thank you so much, Gabriel. Thank you, Katie. It's been a pleasure. So what's next? Well, our decision to raise interest rates is a further step in normalising our monetary policy. More rate hikes will come, and they'll depend on how we see the economy and inflation developing. These rate increases will help bring inflation back to our 2% target. If you want to learn more about this topic, we've lots of resources on our website, and you can find all the links to those in the show notes. That brings us to the end of this episode. I want to thank Gabriel Gluckler for discussing with me what interest rates are and what higher rates mean for people, the economy, and inflation. You've been listening to the ECB podcast with Katie Ranger. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.